I know this much. I was born in New York City in 1924. And my family was uh, middle class. We were not poor, but we were hit hard by the, the Depression. To complicate matters, my father died when he was when I was 16 and he was 48. And my family didn't have enough money to to keep up the quality of life and the standard of living that we fashioned for ourselves. And we moved to smaller and smaller quarters. I had no intellectual predilections. I was an athlete through and through. Basketball was my love. I chose my high school not because of excellence of erudition like uh, Frank's, Frank's High School of Science or, or um, I don't know what other schools featured uh, intelligence and intellectual pursuits. But I was a basketball player. I went to the school which had the best basketball team, and I played seriously enough to become the captain of a, of a high school that maybe had 8,000, 10,000 students in it. Well, when I had to choose uh, uh, high schools, I lived close by to Christopher Columbus High School in the Bronx. I don't, I don't know whether I mentioned I grew up in the Bronx. Uh, in a Jewish family. My father was religious. When my father died, I said prayers for him three times a day for one whole year. Imagine that. And uh, at the end of that time, I realized that I was, didn't believe in the religious patterns that I was asked to go through. And I became, but in my mind, was a deist or an atheist. And over the years, I guess, religion has meant less and less to me. Um, I respect my upbringing by being a, uh, a Jew that observes his Jewishness by eating bagels and lox. Uh, by uh, attending services on Yom Kippur and, uh, and Rosh Hashanah. But um, I'm not really religious at all, I can say that. When I went to school, and, um, I really was not a... Um, well, first of all, let me say it this way. When my father died, and even before that, I had to work part-time. So between going to school getting good grades, which was important to me, and working enough for buying my sundries, I graduated to buy my clothes. And I, I really didn't have very much money to court my young love of the time, who was a beautiful woman that happens to be sitting right next to side of us in the darkness. And um, I became she became my study. I never was her study, but she was my study, I, mainly because I could only go out on dates, well, maybe once or twice uh, a month. Dates consisted of, a, of a spending about 50 to 75 cents on uh, an ice cream soda at uh, Howard Johnson's. I went into the army with the idea of learning a lot of mathematics. First of all, that was my best subject. It was a subject that I didn't have to study at home. It just came naturally to me. I got 100 on all the regent examinations. And people thought of me as saying, oh, he has a mathematical mind. Mathematical mind meant I would sit on my father's lap and he would recite questions like 10 times 10 divided by 2 divided by 5 minus 1 divided by 7 equals. And I had to give, a, give the answer. I was very good at that. But I, I interpreted that as saying that I should really go into something that's scientific. And uh, when we talked about it, when I talked about it with others, they thought that engineering might be a good uh, profession for me. And I looked around and I studied the, the people who, who had advice to give me. 
and they said, Howard, keep away from engineering, it's too anti-Semitic. Well, it turned out that not only engineering was too anti-Semitic, but a lot of other subjects were too anti-Semitic. And when I went to college, I still didn't know what I was going to do. The, um, it's now, I'm 16, it's, I'm, it's 1940, it's in the height of the, of the Depression. And uh, I was a lad of um, 17 or 18 in freshman college at City, City College in New York. It's the college of choice for all poor lads like myself. Very, very good school, high quality. Uh, even I, they had a good basketball team, but I wasn't interested any longer in basketball because I knew I was going to be drafted in my 18th or 19th year into the armed services. I looked, f I looked over the scene and I decided that I would like to become a meteorologist. And the um, Air Force needed people in meteorology and uh, they worked out an arrangement so I could ha get a voluntary induction when I was 18 years old into the Air Force to study meteorology. I went into the Army with the idea of taking basic training and then getting into the Air Force into the meteorology program. While in, meteor in basic training, I took a battery of exams and they found out that I was deficient in mathematics. They gave an exam to everybody involving 20 questions and it, it, was, it was answered by darkening in uh, the appropriate column. And I um, had four right out of 20 by chance. It turned out that they marked the exams by having a, um, a template. And they slid the template down and they marked the ones that were correct or not correct and they were missing. So in a, uh, they were marking X but my template was X plus one. And I got four out of 20 right and it turned out that that was a, an intolerable mark for somebody going into meteorology. So they held my report up and I missed the meteorology school. So I had a choice between um, Baker School or um, automobile mechanics. And I had a, I knew I had to hit a hammer, use a hammer and a screwdriver, but that's about all. I preferred though Baker School, uh, no, medium, no. I preferred um, automobile mechanics to Baker School and as they, as they won't, I was turned down in the, the automobile mechanic school and I went to bakery school. And as I got off the, the various connections, uh, I was told that my transfer came through to the Air Force. So I went back to the Air Force to go back to meteorology but found out that all this delay of a couple of months meant that all the meteorology schools were closed and they had uh, openings in pre-meteorology. Well, that was fine. It was the only thing I could do. I was only eight, 19 years old. And I went to uh, school courtesy of the, of the Air Force to learn enough mathematics, which I already had, to be a member of the meteorological school team. After I finished a course of training in Iowa, it was Iowa State, I think. Um, they informed me that, common to the, their past performance, that they had enough pre-meteorologists and I was closed. I had a choice of other things to do and I chose radar. And I was fine with them. I got a commission as a radar officer, went to Harvard and MIT for a few months got married at the age of 21, and I was 21, my bride was 20. We could have gotten married a little earlier, but we couldn't get permission from my mother. Uh, and I went um, to the radar school 
chose to do radar blind landing as a follow-up. Took that very seriously, and that became an important feature of focus in my life. I studied meteorology, got into the, uh, I'm, I'm sorry, I studied a ground-controlled approach as a way of talking planes down in, incl in inclement, murky conditions. And I could say even to this day that this was probably the most exciting period of my life. I ended up in Japan at an airport at uh, Tsugi in Tachikawa where the weather was miserable. Um, and I and my team had to talk planes down to safety. The Russians refused to give us weather reports over Siberia. Um, the planes came from Alaska and, uh, and Guam to, um, to Japan. They didn't have any much uh, fuel to get to an alternate airport. And I, it was my team versus them crashing with lack of fuel. And that was the, the, uh, the competition. And I had plenty of competition. I was involved in many, many emergency uh, situations, including, uh, not very well known, an emergency situation when General Eisenhower visited MacArthur in Japan and he came in on a day that it was about 400 feet ceiling, which is not very complicated. But the, uh, the incident was memorable because there was a plane that was lost at the same time. And protocol I had was to keep Eisenhower's plane up high and get uh, in contact with this lost uh, plane that evidently had lost its transmission. Well. This didn't sit well with MacArthur, who was waiting outside the, uh, of our equipment. He, he demanded that Eisenhower's plane come down to the ceiling of the other plane, but just keep them apart. And that was, we, we did that. I filed a report of complaints against Eisenhower and MacArthur, Excellent. and it took me about 10 minutes to get it. the report bounced back at me. I had an experience there that was also interesting. It was at the end of the Second World War, and people were being discharged, and my team of 16 men were being rapidly discharged underneath me, and I didn't have enough men to run the equipment. And I decided to set up a school, and I taught uh, pilots that, came, that were, he were heroes in the European theater. They came to the, to, to, uh, the Pacific. They had nothing to do but they decided to become students in my school. And uh, it was through that effort that I was able to continue working on the radar blind landing. Meanwhile, should I stay in the Army? It was a good example of possibility of that. Or how about going back to school? I chose going back to school partly because of the arguments both ways, but partly I missed my bride. And uh, she w lived also in New York City and uh, chose the time when I was overseas to establish residence in Michigan. I chose Michigan because they had a program in actuarial mathematics. And um, people said that that was a good field for me. And in order to get established in actuarial mathematics, you had to solve you had to uh, do well on nine exams. The first three exams were, you could prepare for them uh, with a program given in certain colleges. I find out which is the best college to do this, and it's University of Michigan. So I went to the University of Michigan to study actuarial mathematics, took a year of it, did well on the exams, but hated it. Switched over to statistics, switched over to pure mathematics, because I took a course in pure mathematics that taught people to act like mathematicians. They, you had to solve things that, uh, which, which might have been known in the literature, but you weren't allowed to look at the literature. You had to act as if you were a mathematician, and I was superb at it. 
And uh, because of that, I decided to switch into pure mathematics, which I never dreamt that I would have done uh, prior to going to Michigan. The procedure for getting a doctorate at Michigan is, uh, was like almost every other school. You had to take certain required courses in mathematics, take exams, and uh, it was the, the exam procedure that I would like to talk about. You, I had to write it down, everything I knew about mathematics that interested me, and I submitted that to my thesis committee. And on the basis of that, they decided whether you were ready to take the examination, and if so, should the examination be broad or narrow, and should it be in depth or, or large coverage. And I submitted that. And uh, one afternoon, Estelle, my wife, got a call from, from uh, Professor Brower, very famous algebraist from the University of Michigan. And Brower said, um, the thesis committee examined my written remarks about pre preparatory for my oral exam and decided on the basis of that that I wouldn't have to take my oral exam. So here I was, all the way ready through before I started my exam, and I said, oh yes, the thesis, com uh, thesis committee was appointed, and uh, there was a paper written by uh, Howard several months back on uh, non-zero-sum games that we think is interesting enough to be a thesis. So I said, really? I said, fine, come in. I met my examination committee. They told me that I finished my doctoral exam. Uh, dissertation, that they would accept my paper that I wrote for the engineering department as my doctoral dissertation, and I was through before I started. This was in April of 1950, and I didn't know what to do. So I decided that I would look around, and I found out that there was a seminar being started uh, by a Professor Coombs in the psychology department who worked with Thrall, my thesis supervisor, and they decided to do a, a, pro, a, a project on the use of psychological, mathematical measurement in psychology. They call the people doing that psychometricians. And I was given the task of writing minutes for proposed weekly meetings of that seminar. And I was supposed to write what was said and what should have been said. And that was a great opportunity for me. And I became famous for those notes. And uh, in 1952 it was, I was uh, invited by um, uh, people at Harvard to, take, to uh, apply for an assistant professor in the newly created Department of Statistics. Public policy business was, was far from the scene. And I um, taught statistics at Columbia, and I ran into the first controversy in my uh, adult academic life. I became uh, what they call a subjectivist rather than an objectivist, is now known as the Bayesian school of thought. And I became a full-fledged Bayesian in mind, but not in actuality. Because in actuality, my colleagues in the statistics department disdained the use of subjectivism. They thought using subjective probabilities was a step backwards rather than a step forwards. And they thought that uh, Howard, you didn't come this far to go ahead and to, to delve into uh, things that are basically psych psychology and not science. But I taught what they wanted me to teach, but I was a, a so-called, in my mind, I was a Bayesian, a, a closet Bayesian. Bayesians were the ones that adopted the uh, subjective point of view. It's what the interpretation of probabilities are. Most people, when they think about probabilities, they think about long-run relative frequencies, or they think of equally likely gambling cases. And uh, the subjectivism looked at any quantity and talked about betting odds for that quantity. 
Like, let's suppose we talk about the proportion of pe proportion P of people who will, would support uh, Obama in the next election. That P is a some number. You ask the question, well, what's the chances that P will lie between 0 0.50 and 0.55? And the, the non-subjectivists will say, that's ridiculous. P will either be there or not there. It's not a question of probability that will be there. The subjectivists, on the other hand, focusing on that P, say, what is your state of mind? What's your betting distributions? Those betting distributions aren't grounded in terms of actual statistics, but they're, they're, it's a, something in, in your mind. So it, it turned out that, um, that the subjective point of view was most convenient for the action-oriented. Um, in statistics, you probably remember yourself. You learn about tests of hypothesis, confidence intervals, unbiased estimation. These are the bread and butter topics in statistics. But for the subjectivists, there were irrelevancies. They weren't the, the thing that you wanted to do. What you wanted to do is to focus on if you had a, a if you had a choice between two products, which products should you, should you choose? And the products would be summarized by profit, and you would talk about the uncertain profit and make probability distributions about the uncertain profit. And it's, uh, it's entirely different. The, the procedures are different. The controversy between the Bayesians and the non-Bayesians, between the, the subjectivists and the non-subjectivists, go on to this day. And you'll have fine departments of statistics that will disdain and not hire a subjectivist or a Bayesian. And then there are departments that will put out advertisements, we want Bayesians. So the, the controversy still arises. I worked um, at a behavioral models project. And it, this happened to me lots of times. I uh, became a team member, a uh, member from the Mathematical Statistics Department, from Sociology Department, from Psychology Department, from Economics Department. And all these people, departments were represented by senior professors, and I was a lonely uh, assistant professor. And sure enough, my role was to be the chairman of the group. Uh, the, the chairman of the group was the one that had to do the reports. And so I became um, the rapporteur of that uh, effort, and the, my summaries were widely distributed. And out of the blue, I was asked uh, to, if I wanted a position uh, at Harvard University with the newly created Department of Statistics and the Business School. I didn't know anything about business. I didn't care very, very about business. I was a theoretician. We were taken out to Lewis. We were taken out by uh, Professor Fox uh, to a very fancy Italian restaurant in, uh, in New York City. And he wanted to sing the praises of the Harvard Business School. And during that conversation, I inadvertently let it be known that I didn't think that Columbia had a business school which they had, of course, a thriving business school, just like Harvard had a thriving business school at Harvard, but I didn't even know about the existence of the, that department. Nevertheless, I went there. I went there because I had a joint appointment between statistics and the business school. I was appointed as an associate professor of statistics. And I... Um, thought mainly in the statistics department, and I thought what I would do is to uh, find out a little about this stuff about uh, statistics and business. And uh, I was surprised at two ends. First of all, I was dis surprised at the quality of the people that I worked with at the business school. They were all, incidentally, interested in the the probability distribution of profits, the, and it was the, they took the Bayesian point of view of subjectivism. So I became comfortable there. I also met a 
fellow by the name of Robert uh, Schleifen, who was a Greek scholar. And he was the, um, the utility infielder of the business school. Whenever they needed some subject taught, they called up Robert Schleifen, and he would learn enough about it to teach it. He was a classical Greek scholar. And the statistician, a year before I came on the scene, died and Robert Schlaper was appointed as in charge of the statistical program. So as a good classicist, he read some of the classics and statistics. He didn't think that was appropriate. And independently, he discovered the Bayesian point of view. And he was, uh, he was delighted to have a kindred soul. The trouble was he didn't know very much mathematics. And for the next three to four years, I became his personal tutor. He was the best student I've ever had. And he was a, he was a mathematical genius that was gone straight in the past. But between the two of us, we were very productive in our pursuit of the Bayesian statistics. We called ourselves uh, professors of statistics. He was a full professor. I was at that time an associate professor. This was brought, uh, bringing us up to about 1960. Well, I've actually published a, a more important book. It was uh, Games and Decisions. It was published in 1957. That book um, was was um, was evidently very popular among social scientists, and a lot of social scientists and economics and psychology and political science found that that book was relevant to to what they were doing. And that uh, that book was um, it's still selling, but it, it's uh, it's not so much statistics that that was in that book, but was in the book the the thing that I did my thesis on it was the non-zero sum game, and um, that was uh, 1950, 1960. We had a seminar going, Robert and I, at the business school, which was open to the rest of the university. And to my delight, it attracted lots of people all over the university. And uh, the emphasis of the, of the seminar was not statistics, but was managerial economics. Again, it was sliding, sliding toward the uh, interpretation of Bayesian statistics. And um, in 1964, I was approached by uh, John Dunlop, who was a professor of economics, saying that they had money given to them, to the business school and to the economics department for a chair in uh, the area that I seemed to be carving out. And he asked me whether I was willing to accept it the chair and I was delighted. Mainly, I didn't, I never took a course in economics in my life. And here I was given a, a name chair in economics and the business school. When Derek Bach asked me to read a proposal that he received from several faculty members from the, from the Faculty of Political Administration in the law school, uh, suggesting the creation of a new school, which later turned out to be the Kennedy School. And he asked me what I thought of the proposal. And I read it very carefully, and I said that I didn't think the proposal was very good because it didn't make contact enough with the, the world of, of reality. It was too oriented toward the doctoral studies. And what was needed was a school in public administration, akin to the business school that I was in, that I was uh, enamored with the case method and thought that the case method in the public sphere would be just as good as the case method at the private sphere. They pushed me and say, how much do you want in the case method? The case method in the business school is right around 90% of the, of the instruction. And I said, well, I would be happy with 40%. Uh, it was that that got me into be involved in a small committee, 
and my position prevailed, I'm happy to say. Uh, the, the school was oriented toward a, an entity by itself rather than um, a joint cooperation between economics and the school or law and the school. The professors that were associated with the Kennedy School uh, were, were mainly had joint appointments, including myself. But I thought that they should have a faculty of its own, a building of its own, the location should be closer to the business school than to the law school, uh, that it should be, a, a, while there was, should be a professional school, uh, some efforts should be made to develop a doctoral program. And that's what happened. That's what led me into the Kennedy School. Again, I didn't think that this was too difficult because I had the pattern of the business school. Um, I knew there had to be um, a subject in the foundations of, um, of quantitative thinking that involved modeling, the theory of probability, uh, the applications that we found in the business school would uh, would be roughly right, but you need to get examples from the public sector where people had to make decisions. So, the decision making of 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 would be players in the public sphere that came on center stage. I taught a course in uh, mathematical modeling and decision making. Uh, helping me were such stalwarts as. Richard Zeckhauser, um, Edith Stokey, Mike Spence. Some of my students were like uh, Milton Weinstein. They were just absolutely superb students, superb faculty. Uh, I was uh, sort of a maverick coming from the business school, opting for an applied orientation but yet being theoretical enough to have established a name in, uh, in what is called Bayesian statistics. Uh, there were not enough full faculty members to do all the chores that was necessary. And I became in succession head of different aspects of administration, like in charge of the promotion standards. And I, I wrote out a, a, a several page version of what we would look for in promotions. And um, we're still used. But we had to give more stress to applied work, more stress to involvement in real, real world problems. Uh, I rapidly became known as a, as a, someone who applied mathematical models and thinking to different areas. First of all, it was I became it was a professor of statistics. Then in 1964, when I got my 62 or so, when I got my full professorship, it was a professor of managerial economics. Managerial economics meant something about getting out there in the real world and looking at the problems of managers. Uh, it was a, a, a false. Uh, I was, I was, not being perfectly honest because someone would expect that someone who managed early economics would be an economist, and I never took a course in economics. I think the people who played a role in pushing me to this joint appointment were people like Tom Schelling, who read my works who claims that my book in Games and Decisions is a book that he has spent more time with than any other book in his library. Um, it was just a magnificent array of people. And I never had a feeling that I was pulling in the wrong direction. I was just feeling that I was pulling in a direction where loads and loads of people wanted to come. Well, when I first started, the um, bottom line was profit. And what you wanted to do is to uh, work out uh, ex 
to maximize expected profits. You put judgmental probability distributions of the profitability of certain action or certain strategy. And then uh, gradually um, the criterion became broader into involved multiple attributes, multiple attributes to look at. There's not only profits, but there's stability. It has something to do with the, with the importance to making contributions to, to society. It became a multi-attributed performance. I remember I, one summer I went to Rand Corporation and I was invited there to comment about their research work. And I commented that what I thought was, was wonderful was the quality of work but somehow the, the objective functions were a little sh shy of what reality was because they didn't bring in such things as, uh, as the intangibles that didn't have a, a ready monetary uh, assignment. It was about that time that I got interested in uh, applications in medicine. I was approached by uh, Dr. Schwartz, who was the head of of, media, of clinical medicine at uh, yeah. New England Medical School. And he uh, fell in love with the approach of decision analysis to medical problems. And I worked with him very closely. It was, uh, certainly the objective was not to maximize money or minimize money. It was not an, ob an economic objective. So I found out that the my title of first statistics then to managerial economics was a little wrong because it left out important areas that I was interested in, in, in public policy and in medicine. So I now think of myself as a, um, use some mathematical models in decision making, broadly interpreted. Uh, about this time, it's about 1968 now. I'm talking about. I was got received a telephone call from McGeorge Bundy, who was an earlier dean of of the, of Harvard, dean of the faculties. I then became a pre presidential advisor, and then was the Ford uh, president of the Ford Foundation. He asked me how it. Can you give me a few days of consulting time? And I said, Well, if it isn't too time consuming, I'm willing to do it. And little did I know that I would be involved in something that would occupy me for years and years and years, probably full time. And Harvard uh, was, um, was second responsibility. He was approached by President Johnson to establish, to see if it would make sense to establish a, an international think tank in decision making. Um, Bundy made contact with a, uh, with a statesman from the Soviet Union, uh, Grishiani, uh, and uh, they decided to uh, investigate. I became Bundy's assistant on these negotiations. I helped create and write the charter for the, the, uh, for the existence of, of what was later called YASA, the International Institute of Applied Systems Analysis. I became its, it was during the Cold War. Imagine during the Cold War getting a think tank set up to do problems common to advanced societies. How do you organize something like this? How do you decide on what salary should be? Imagine trying to make, get a salary schedule between a uh, professor from the Eastern European country like Poland or East Germany or Russia and getting a, and someone from France or or the United States. Well, anyway, uh, I had a ball for three, four years. It was the most exciting part of my life except for my radar blind landing experiences. I did a good job. After three years, I decided to come back to Harvard, and my, I had to go back to my, my true loves, the business school and the Kennedy School. I suppose in that order. 
And I, when I came back, I decided that um, what was missing in the program at the Kennedy School and at the business school was how to use the, this systematic, systematic methodology for, for negotiations, for, for entering into decisions that involved negotiating parties, where people pulled different directions. And the rest of my career, from 76 to 94 when I retired, I was really involved in negotiations analysis. That was a success story. To my dismay, the negotiation analysis became required required subject. And it was so important that it had to push out something else. And when it pushed out was the old um, stuff that I developed with Zekhaus and Stokey and others. It was the use of mathematical reasoning in decision making of societies and, and individuals. And uh, it didn't have very much to do with negotiations. And the negotiations supplanted it. So I was a success in, in, in helping the, the demise of stuff that I once thought was key and important. Now I understand the business schools like uh, and the Kennedy School are having second thoughts, and they think that they should uh, support for the required curriculum of the master's degree. They should support uh, negotiation analysis and uh, analysis uh, for decision making. I know I look upon decision making as a lifetime skill that should be taught for the first time in graduate students, but should be taught to people in high school. And um, that's what I'd like to see us push. Oh, I'm just delighted at the interaction between the uh, pedagogical side of the Kennedy School and the practical side of the interacting with the society. We have so many people that are there on projects and doing such work and such stimulation. It's wonderful. But yet there seems to be uh, maintaining a standard of scholarship that um, I think is exemplary.